so they were living in a very hard time in history, a very difficult time in history. Then there was a famine in the land, a natural disaster. That affects the economy. That affects just having food to put on the table for your family. And on top of that, there's just layers and layers. Uh, Naomi's husband dies. Naomi's two sons die. So one of Ruth's husband dies. And so they are faced with some challenges, with some conflict. And praise God, I didn't stop just in chapter one last week because everybody would have just went home depressed. (laughs) If I would have stopped last week in the bitter, difficult circumstances that Naomi and Ruth were facing, we we probably would have went home in with discouragement. But the the Bible or this this is meant to be read in one one whole setting. Okay, this is this is a, a whole a story four chapters to be told at one time, and so I want to do my best to tell the whole story, the rest of the story today, and, and try to re- recap the the last couple of chapters. We're gonna we're gonna focus on chapter two and and highlight some different elements within the story. Um, but then we're going to summarize. I'm going to summarize the, the second two half, the second two chapters. Uh, the title of my sermon today is Romance, Race, and Redemption. How about that? Romance, Race, and Redemption. The book of Ruth is a love story. And God's not ashamed of having a love story in his holy scriptures. If you've ever read the book of Solomon, you know what I'm talking about, all right? All you married couples say, Amen. God is not ashamed to have a love story in the Bible because he's the one who created sexuality and love and affection, the, 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 the joy and the delight and the pleasure that a husband and a wife get to enjoy within the context of marriage. He's the, he's the ultimate uh, lover, if you will, the one who shows faithful love to his people. Uh, the Bible likens his people to be like a bride. To be his bride, okay, and and him to be that faithful, loving husband who's consistent and steady and loyal. Uh, we also have the issue of race within this book. So we have Boaz, the Jewish guy, the godly, noble Jew, and then we have Ruth, the Moabite, a Gentile, and the Moabites were known for seducing israelite men and and they were they were enemies of israel they were not a part of the jewish people and yet we see god accepting and working in the life of this moabite who becomes committed to the one true god of israel and god blesses her and brings redemption to and through her life and then we see this beautiful picture of redemption throughout the story so if you got your bibles there let's turn to ruth chapter 2 um, and then here's the big idea. This is where we're going. This is basically the same thing I said last week, and we're just going to look at some different aspects of the story. The big idea is this, that God graciously and faithfully cares for his people, and he sovereignly works out his good plans in their lives as they remain faithful to him. God is working. God is at work, though we may not see it, though we may not feel it. And, and though when, when we're in chapter 1 of Ruth and though we're in chapter 1 of Ruth in our own lives, when bitter circumstances come our way and the struggle is intense and painful and hard and you don't see any rays of hope, God is at work. God is at work. He is doing something. Amen? So he, he graciously and faithfully cares for his people, and he sovereignly works out his good plans in their lives as they remain faithful to him. Ruth chapter 2, uh, we're going to read 1 through 4. Now Naomi had a relative whose husband, of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean from the ears of grain After him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Um, So we see. We see Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, coming on the scene. This is where some, some rays of hope start to shine through. This is where some sparks of romance 
start start occurring within this chapter. Here's some possibilities here. There's there here is where where uh, Naomi and Ruth start to get glimpses of of some hope that God is going to uh, redeem and restore and, and and work goodness on their behalf. But I just want to point out verse three how the author describes this. That it just happened, she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Now some might call this luck. She just got lucky. All right? Some, some call this luck. As Christians, we don't believe in luck, right? Some may call this coincidence. Well, it was just coincidence. She just happened. But as Christians, we believe in something called providence. We believe in something called favor. We believe that God ordains and orders the steps of his people that he's working in and through in behalf of his people. And so luck and coincidence, there's no, there's no room for that in our lives. Nothing goes wasted in the lives of the people of God. God uses it. He works through it to bring good to our lives, even though we may not feel it. And we may not see it. Amen? So it just so happened to come to the part of the field. She came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. By the way, we talked about a couple weeks ago how the, God commanded that the poor would be provided for through the gleanings in the fields. That, that the harvesters were not to reap the edges of the field. Don't exhaust all the, 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 the income that they have as farmers. But they were to leave the edge of the field so that the poor, the widow, and the fatherless can come and get some food and have some food for themselves. So God was making provision for Ruth and Naomi who had become widows. Okay, so it just happened. So here, here's what I want to say about this verse, that the faithful tend to be in the right place at the right time. The faithful tend to be in the right place at the right time. And we, we, we may see it like, well, it just happened. It just, like, just happened like that. We, we, that may be our perspective, but God is, is up to something. Uh, Proverbs 28, verse 20, it says that a faithful man will bound with many blessings. You see, Ruth had shown herself faithful even when there were no perks in sight. Even when there wasn't promise in sight in her life. She said to Naomi after husband dies, her, Naomi's husband dies, Ruth's husband dies, uh, things are hard, things are tough. Naomi's too old to have another baby. And then she, Naomi's like, I can't have another baby. And, and then you marry him. That, you, you're not going to wait for that. That's ridiculous, right? So the other sister-in-law, she, Orpah, she's out. I'm going back to Mo, the Moab where there's some perks. All right. <laughs> back to her, her, her gods. She went back to her, her gods. But, and we talked about last week how as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to have this kind of resolve and commitment to our Redeemer, to our Savior, to our Lord, to the one true God. We are to be with him through thick and thin he, though he, you know, things are going smooth or, or though things are really tough in life. You know, we have some baptisms today, three baptisms here. We got Matthew, who is professing publicly his, his faith in Jesus Christ. We have Jose, who is professing his faith in Jesus Christ. We have Sonia, professing her faith in Jesus Christ. And they are declaring publicly that they're not ashamed. Yeah, we can clap for that. They are declaring openly their commitment to follow Jesus. And that may involve some really bumpy, difficult, bitter, hard times. Jesus said the way that leads to life is narrow and difficult. And it may not seem like there's a lot of perks at times. Okay? But, but as we, the people of God, be faithful to Him, we can expect His blessings to come our way. We can expect His goodness and mercy to follow us all the days of our life. We can expect Him to take a bitter circumstance and make it sweet. He can make it sweet. I love the story in Exodus 15 when the Israelites were delivered through the Red Sea. And then they, they came to for three days. They had no water. And then they came to uh, some water. And, and, and the waters were bitter. Okay? They were like, all right, we got some water. Three days. They're like, oh. It's bitter. It's no good. And so they complained, and God, uh, Moses cried out to God. God showed Moses a tree, and he threw it into the tree, and he turned the waters from bitter to sweet. Now, there is a tree that you and I, Christian, 
in, in, in our understanding that takes the bitterness and the brokenness and the sinfulness of our lives. And God makes it sweet through the work of Jesus Christ hanging on that tree, on that cross for us. He takes the bitterness and the brokenness of our, our, our lives and he redeems, forgives, cleanses, and he makes something sweet and beautiful. Even through our bitter, bitter, difficult circumstances. So the faithful tend to be in the right place at the right time. We see this with Ruth. She was faithful. She told Naomi, I'll go where you go. Your God shall be my God. Ruth was not only faithful to Naomi, but Ruth was faithful to Naomi's God. The one true God of Israel, the only true Redeemer, the only one who could do something about their circumstances. And she was committed to this one true God, as we'll see here in a minute. Boaz points this out. Verse 5. And, and by the way, let me just say this. Ruth, Ruth is a woman of noble character. So being a woman of noble character, a worthy woman, or the, the same term is used in Proverbs 31, a virtuous woman. We got any Proverbs 31 women up in here? All right. I think we do. I think we do. And maybe you're too humble to admit it. Yeah. I'm a, or you're waiting for your husband to say, yeah, yeah, she's one. You, guys, you better nod, okay, and smile. Give, give her a twinkle in, in, her, in your eye. You know, let her see that you believe she is a worthy, noble woman of character and excellence. Amen. So Boaz saw this in, in Ruth. She was a woman of initiative. Verse 2, back here it says, she says, Ruth to, to Naomi, she says, let me go in the field and glean from among the ears of grain. Okay, let me go get some food for us. She, she, she was taking initiative. She wasn't just sitting back, passive, just waiting like somebody needs to bring us some food around here. And, and the poor, when it, when it came to the gleanings, the poor had to go and glean it themselves. They had to go get it and get it. It was there for them to take, but they had to go get it. They had to get up off their seat and go get the provision that was there before them. All right? And, and so what we see here is we see God, God providing for widows. Naomi and Ruth, they were widows. God is a provider, protector, defender of orphans and widows. He's providing for them. So that was one of their problems, one of the conflicts, one of the challenges. They didn't have a provider. It was really hard in ancient Israel, in the ancient world, for a widow to survive without a man in the home to provide, a husband, a man, a provider in the home to take care of them. It was hard. It was difficult. So they needed a provider. They needed a protector. Widows were vulnerable to the attacks and, and the misuse and, and abuse of others in the ancient world. And they needed some family. You know, they needed, they needed some family. And so God was providing, he was protecting, and he was setting the lonely into a family. He's good at doing that. So he was working on their behalf. Ruth was faithful. She was doing her part, all right? We just need to keep doing our part and be faithful. Whatever God has us doing, wherever God has us, whatever relationships that he's given us, we just need to be faithful. Whatever gifts he's given us, whatever opportunities he's given us, we need to be faithful to it. Even when we don't see the perks or we don't see promise and it's hard and it's difficult, God rewards faithfulness. And guys, I want to hear from Jesus one day, well done, good and faithful servant. That's, that's what I long to hear. Well done. From his lips, well done, good and faithful servant. And so, so Ruth is an example for us of faithfulness. She was a woman of initiative. She was, a, she was humble. She was, she was industrious. She was working uh, from early morning to night. She was working hard to bring some food back for her and Naomi. All right? And then she had to carry it all home. Okay, she was working hard to glean, and then she had to carry it all home. All right? So there were some noble qualities going on with this girl. And Boaz sees that, by the way. And by the way, if you're single and you're looking for a spouse, that is something you need to look for in your spouse. Somebody who loves the Lord, who's committed to the Lord, who is a person of character, who's not only beautiful on the outside, but they are beautiful on the inside. And there is substance and character and faithfulness and beauty on the inside that you see. Because that makes marriage sweet when you've got a, a spouse 
who has beauty on the inside, character on the inside, commitment, faithfulness, love, loyalty, kindness, and so on. And Ruth had some of those qualities. Okay, so verse 5. Then Boaz said to the young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose who's young woman is this? All right, now we, some sparks of romance are going, all right? This, just pretend you're in the movies, all right? You're watching the movie. This, this is like a chick flick. I like watching movies with my wife every once in a while. And, and, you know, there's times when I'll look over, we're watching, you know, a love story, chick flick, you know, some, some love story. And I'll look over, and, you know, she got tears in her eyes. And she's, oh, what's going to happen next? Or, you know, and, and it, she's just, like, caught up in the story. Let's get caught up in this story here because this is a love story, beautiful romantic love story, and God's not ashamed to have that in the Bible. All right? Okay, so he's like, whose woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. By the way, that, that's not appealing to the average Jewish guy. She's, she's from Moab. She's the Moabite woman. Okay, all right, I see. You know, so, so like Boaz is probably, uh, that, that's probably a barrier for Boaz. Interracial marriage was not uh, smiled upon in the ancient world, all right? There was actually warnings against especially marrying other, other spouses who worship other gods. In the New Testament, we're, we're told, you know, don't be unequally yoked. You know, we want to find a spouse who is worshiping the same God, right? Otherwise, marriage is going to be really, really hard, <laughs> So this was a hurdle, the issue of race here. This hurdle is overcome. This hurdle is overcome because God doesn't, doesn't show favoritism or partiality with people. He will take and receive anybody who comes to him. And we see in Boaz, we see a man who's able to look past just the externals. Okay? He's able to look into the heart and the character of this woman, Ruth. Uh, she said, please let me go glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. And she said, she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Okay, she was an industrious woman, hard-working, hard-working woman. She was at work, taking care of business. There was no time to ch- chat and hang out and chill. She was working. They needed some food. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter. Do not go and glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. So here we see protection here. Through Boaz, we see God protecting Ruth. He's providing. He's protecting. All right. Now she, she just needs a man. All right. She needs a husband. She needs some family, some companionship, somebody to do life with. And then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Okay. There's some humility in this statement. Why, why are you taking notice of me? Me, Ruth. I'm a Moabite. I'm a widow. I was barren for ten years. Life has been really hard for me. Why are you taking notice of me? I'm not, I'm not Jewish. And so there's this issue, again, there's this issue of race. There's, she's a foreigner, you know. Why, why are you showing this kindness to me? By the way, Boaz is, is displaying covenant faithfulness, the kind of faithfulness God expected of his people to open their hands to the poor, to care for the widow, the fatherless, the, the orphan, to, to take care of them. Boaz is, is doing that. He's fulfilling his responsibilities as a godly Jewish person in, in that time. Whether she was a foreigner or not, he was opening his hand to help her out. Whether he ended up marrying her or not, he's going to help her out. All right? So there's beautiful loyalty and faithfulness displayed here. And so there's this humble response. Why do you take notice of me? And Boaz answered, I love this. All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me how you left your father and mother in your native land and you came to a people you did not know the lord repay you for what you have done and full reward be given to you by the lord the god of israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge this is beauty she was committed to the one true god of israel she was taking refuge not just in, in, in getting a handout and, and protection and blessing from Boaz, 
uh, and, and not just being committed to Naomi and walking with Naomi through really hard times. She was taking refuge in Naomi's God, her God now. She was taking refuge in him. And she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord. You have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. So there's some romance here, right? Tenderness in, in Boaz communication. That's winsome. Husbands, I want to encourage us men, let's comfort our wives and speak kindly and tenderly to them. Okay, this is explicit in New Testament. Husbands, don't be bitter with your wives. All right? Instead, here, let's comfort them, speak kindly, and be tender and affectionate towards them. So, so Ruth was taking shelter in the shadow of God's wings. I love this imagery. There's several other places in Scripture that this imagery is used, where uh, Jesus talked about, you know, himself, you know, him wanting to gather Israel like a mother hen, but they were unwilling. He wanted to gather them and, and kind of take them under uh, his wings. And, and, and David talks a lot about this, about God, uh, us being covered under the shadow of his wings. Psalm 91. Uh, so there's this imagery of, of like a, a mother bird caring for baby bird and, and taking, spreading the wings over baby bird to, to care for and protect and shelter. This is, this is, this is beauty. This is, this is the mercy of God. The kindness and the, the tender mercies of God. The Hebrew word is hesed. hesed. This, is, this is the loyal, faithful love, kindness, and goodness of God being displayed. And that's what takes bitter circumstances and makes them sweet. It's his mercy and his kindness and his goodness in our lives. And that's something we have to hold on to. When we're going through our trials, when we're going through difficulties, when life is really, really hard, we got to believe not only that he's sovereign. I talked about this last week, that God is sovereign. He's in charge. Nothing catches him by surprise. He wasn't like, oops, I didn't know that was going to happen to Job. I didn't know that was going to happen to Ruth and Naomi. Better do something and, and turn it around real quick. No, God is a loving father, and he filters everything that comes through and to the, the, his people. Ruth was taking shelter in, in the one true God. And God receives and shelters all who take refuge in him. There's several verses on that. He's a refuge to the poor. Uh, blessed is the man. Happy is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Uh, Psalm 511. I love this. I posted this on our Facebook page yesterday. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing for joy and spread your protection over them. That those who love your name may exult in you. God will shelter even a foreigner, a Moabite woman who's coming to him to take shelter in him. Amen. Peter had to learn this lesson in the New Testament that God was going to bring in and shelter and rescue and redeem Gentiles. And God let him know his plan, and he revealed it to him by his spirit and communicated through a vision that, that, that he was going to save the Gentiles. And the early church kind of wrestled with this. Race is an issue. Even within the church, racism is an itch, issue. And God just wants to knock those barriers down. He wants to knock those barriers down. And part of our vision here at City Church is to reach across those barriers that divide us, whether it be race denominations or, or whatever, and let the gospel knock those barriers down and unite a people for his namesake, for the gospel's sake. Amen? Boaz had heard about Ruth's faithfulness. Okay, let me just say this. Saints, your faithfulness has not gone, gone unseen. Your labor of love and your work of faith has not gone unnoticed. By God, he sees it, and he will reward you openly. I know at times we feel like our labor of love and our work of faith and our commitment and our sacrifice, it often feels like nobody sees. Who sees this? Who sees this? Moms, you, you know you feel like this when you're changing diapers and you're getting up at 2, 3 in the morning because there's a sick baby. And dads, dads too. We had, we had one of those nights the other night with 
with our little one. But you can just feel like, who sees this? Who's, I'm, I'm being faithful here. I'm being diligent here. I'm being loyal here. Who sees this? God sees this. God sees your faithfulness. God sees your heart, and he will reward you openly. Don't lose heart. Trust that he sees you. He knows your circumstances. He's moved with compassion for you. He's working out a good plan. If you can just hold on, don't give up. Like David, he said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Psalm 27, 13. Believe that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. God sees and he rewards. Let's move on here. There's a little romance here in verse 14, 15. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat. Eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. And she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. And when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. She's being protected, provided for again. Also, pull out some from, from the bundles to her and leave it for her to glean. And do not rebuke her. And so she gleaned in the field until evening. And she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. I think that's a lot. I didn't look it up. She took it up and went to the city. Okay, so she had a journey. She had to carry that ephah of, of barley to the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she gleaned, and she also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? Where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I worked today was Boaz. Now here's where it starts getting juicy. Here's where rays of hope start breaking through the dim clouds of despair and discouragement. Boaz is his name. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living, forsaken the living or the dead. And Naomi said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Woo! Naomi, who was, who was saying in chapter 1, the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. Don't call me Naomi. My name means pleasant. Call me Mara. That means bitter. That's more fitting for me right now. She had some honest pain and grief, and she let folks know, hey, I'm not pleasant. I'm not going to try to be pleasant for you because I'm not pleasant right now. Give me some space. I'm grieving. Lost my husband. Lost my sons. Life's hard. Life's difficult. Okay? Now... The kindness, the hesed of God, the kindness of God shown through Boaz, an instrument of God's hesed, mercy, kindness, loyal love. She, she, she praises him. She blesses him. May he be blessed by the Lord. So there's a blessing, Barak. There's a blessing. May he be blessed whose kindness. May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness the, uh, has not forsaken the living or the dead. And the man was a close relative, one of our redeemers. So, so check this out. God's kindness, his hesed, shines through the clouds of despair. So here's where things turn around. You see, as I said earlier, when you're going through bitter, difficult trials, hard times, you've got to not only believe in and trust in the sovereignty of God, that he's working, that this didn't catch him off guard, that he's still in control, he's still almighty, he didn't get like knocked off the throne, he has to get back up because things are getting out of control. He still holds everything together with the word of his power, okay? But he is tender and good and kind, and he graciously cares and faithfully cares for his people. He's working. There, I, I love the phrase uh, tender mercies. I believe it's in Psalm 25 where it talks about the tender mercies of God. There's these tender mercies that he surrounds us with and showers us with. And, and Ruth and Naomi were starting to experience it. And all of a sudden, Naomi gets this scheming, plotting in a good, righteous way. Like, ooh, we got we to gotta take some action here. We can't just sit back. All right? So we see the hesed of God the shining through. This is where things turn. Trust in God's mercy. 
No matter what you're going through, trust in God's mercy. So let's talk a little bit about a kinsman redeemer. The, the Hebrew word is goel, okay, a kinsman redeemer. And so uh, this is taken from one commentary, New International Commentary, I believe. The goel was responsible for the repurchase of property once owned by clan members but sold for economic necessity. By restoring the land to the original owner, the goel, the redeemer, maintained the clan's inheritance intact. There, there was this responsibility on um, on extended relatives in, in ancient Israel that God says, you know, if, if, if there's a widow and there's, you know, tragedy or, or uh, whether it's land or whether it's them because of poverty having to sell themselves as slaves, they could be redeemed, whether people or property, by a goel, a kinsman redeemer. So somebody that had to be, uh, had to have the right, had to be the next in line for that, and they had to be willing and they had to be able to do so. They had to be willing. So the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, had to be willing and he had to be able to redeem the property or the people. If financially able, he also redeemed relatives whose property had forced them to to see themselves in uh, slavery. (laughs) So they had to be willing and able. And I love this because this points us and reminds us to the great redeemer we sing about today who is willing, who is able to redeem. There's no one else that was able and is able to redeem people and pay the purchase for their sins ultimately and eternally erase, remove, cleanse, forgive, and wash away sins. But Jesus Christ and his blood, he is able because he is God The Son of Man, He became man, and He is God. The Son of God, He came in to the earth, and He lived a sinless life, and He died on our behalf. So He's able, He's strong, He's powerful, and oh boy, He is willing. He is willing to redeem us. He's willing to accept us. He's willing to cleanse us and forgive us and give us everlasting life. And we'll just come if we'll just respond to His mercy, respond to His grace. He's willing, and He's able and Boaz reflects some of these same qualities that our Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ reflect. He is our Redeemer. Amen. Romantic redemption. Romantic redemption. And Ruth the Moabite said, besides, and Ruth the Moabite said, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good. My daughter, that you go out with, this, with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and the, and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Like, here's some hope. Here's, there's, there's this guy, and he could redeem, and he could be the one. And she just she lived with her mother-in-law. Like, come on. What's, what's, come on. Where's the, where's the good stuff here? Right? You know, she lived with her mother-in-law. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, but, like, we, we want to see them get married, right? Okay. Um, so, so chapter 3. Naomi and her mother-in-law, this is where Naomi starts scheming in a good way, in a righteous way. Na- Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you? It may be well with you. Is not Boaz our relative with, with, whose, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, and do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies down, then go and uncover his feet, and lie down, and he, and he will tell you what to do. I don't think this would be my advice for Ruth if I was there. It sounds a little shady, you know, but this is... This is strategic, and it's righteous. There's, there's nothing immoral, I don't think, at all in this. It's a little risky. It's very risky in, in more than one way. But Naomi says, all right, girl, you need to get cleaned up, okay, get freshened up, get your smell good on, and I want you to go out <laughs> and, and let Boaz know that you're available and that he's, he's actually a, the, one of the kinsmen's redeemers. All right, so she's 
Naomi's like, come on, you can do this. Let's do this. And this is what uh, one, one pastor author in his book, John Piper in, in uh, Bitter and Sweet Providence, one thing he calls um, strategic righteousness, and I love this phrase, strategic righteousness. And, and, and so he comments on this, and he says, by righteousness, I mean a zeal for doing what is good and right, a zeal for doing what is fitting when God is taken into account as sovereign and merciful. By strategic, I mean that there is intention, there's purposefulness, planning. Um, there is a kind of inactive righteousness that simply avoids evil. Okay? There is this, you know, we just, hey, I don't do that. I don't watch that kind of stuff. I don't say that kind of stuff. I don't hang out with those kind of people. You know, I don't live like that. Okay, that's good and righteous. Uh, but there's a strategic righteousness that takes initiative and dreams of how God might make things right. I love this. We got some strategic righteousness going on here. We got a matchmaker. She's a matchmaker. Naomi is a matchmaker uh, for Ruth here, and she she has an idea. She has a plan. She's scheming. What what can we do? And it's and it's risky. And she replied, "All that you say, I will do." All right. She took counsel. I trust you. You're a godly woman. We're, we can do this. Let's go. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And Boaz had eaten and drank his drunk and his heart was merry and he went to lay down at the end of the heap of grain so he was he was happy he was full he was in a good mood all right that's a good time to talk to a brother right when he's in a good mood like you got something something important to talk to him about all right he's in a good he's ready all right this is this is the time okay timing is important you know we can we can do and say the right thing but at the wrong time and make make a mess of things is that not right we can do and say what's right and true, but then say it at the wrong time and hurt our friends, hurt our spouses, hurt our coworkers. Timing. Uh, that's, that's an element that's important to romance. It's timing. All right? The timing of it. All right? Plan it. Okay. So, so um, and Boaz, had, he was happy. He, was, he had eaten. She came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Now, this is kind of weird. This kind of like, I mean, our minds start thinking like, okay, where's this going here? She's going to go lay down, uncover his feet. First of all, that's just weird. Uncover his feet and then lay down at his feet. Like, what's going on here? Are you going to tickle his feet? You know, I mean, come on now. So this kind of seems awkward, weird. I wouldn't, this wouldn't be my counsel for any single folks <laughs> trying to get married. Um, but God used this plan, all right? God worked through this plan. It worked, all right? Uh, she uncovered his feet, okay? And then at midnight, the man was startled, and he turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. God, you answered my prayer. Who is this? He said, who are you? <laughs> I'm just kidding. He didn't say, God, you answered my prayer. Uh, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. There is beauty in here. She is, she's taking a huge risk in more than one way. She's taking a huge risk. She's proposing. The woman's proposing to the man. Like, I don't recommend that. Like, come on, guy, you need to take initiative, bro. Come on. Some guys need a little help, though. Some guys are a little shy, kind of shy and afraid, you know. I needed some help with my wife, just going to be honest. I'm, I'm thankful for uh, dear friends and, and, and leadership in my life, Brad and Angela Weir, and how they just kind of help with me and my wife, like, hey, y'all want to get together? Y'all want to come over for lunch? Y'all want to hang out? And just kind of set the, set the stage so that sparks can fly and God can do what he's going to do, all right? Spread your wings over. So she's risking being rejected right here. She's proposing to him, all right? And, and then she's also risking, like, he could take advantage of her right now, or things can go immoral right now. Like they could, you know, sleep together outside of marriage, not, not having a covenant before God, and God don't like that, all right? That's sin. Fornication is sin. Adultery is sin. And so she, it's, this is risky, but it's righteous. There's, I think there was a righteous intent and a righteous strategy in this. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord. So here's the response. It worked. May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You've made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after the young men, whether poor or rich. So uh, Boaz was a little bit older, mid-aged, you know. The young, you haven't gone over 
and he was he he was wealthy. He had you know he was a businessman. He had it going on. And now my my daughter, do not fear, for I will do for you what you all that you ask. And for all my fellow townsmen, oh, let's see. For all, let's see. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Proverbs thirty one. Woman of excellence. Woman of noble character. I've seen it. All the townsmen have seen it. You've been tested. You've been tried. You've shown your faithfulness with your mother-in-law when nobody else was looking but God. The town has seen it. You're a woman of character, and that's, what I, that's the kind of woman I want to marry. All right? And everybody's seen it. They, they have seen your godliness. They've seen your loyalty, your excellence, your noble character. Now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet... There is another guy in the picture. There is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight in the morning, and if he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. I love this. It, maybe, that's, maybe that's the guy. You know, you know he, 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 Boaz just seemed to kind of have this open hand, like, if this is God, it will it'll work. But yet he, there's initiative here. Uh, remain tonight if, if he will redeem, good. But if he is not willing to redeem you, remember you had to be willing and Abel, if he's not willing, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. Okay? Nothing unholy there. All right? Didn't go past that. It was midnight. There was, it was risky. But no unholy scenes in this one. All right? No unholy kisses and touching and all that stuff. It, there, was, there was strategic righteousness, and it worked. Okay? goes on. She lays at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another. Okay? She was wise. You better get out of there, girl. And, and he said, uh, <laughs> let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. She held it out, measured out six measures of barley, put it in it. And she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? How'd it go? How'd it go? How did you fare? And she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, the, these six measures of barley he gave to me. And he said to me, you must go you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And she replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter goes, how it turns out. For the man will not rest, but settle the matter today. So Boaz is going to take care of this, all right? Just wait, just wait. Okay, I'm going to just sum up chapter 3. So this other guy, so Boaz calls the, the elders of the town. They come together, and they, they, he explains the situation. He lets them know, hey, you're next in line. You have the right. To repurchase the property. Okay, so he explains that. And the guy says, I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay? But then he says, oh, and just so you know, there's also a Moabite woman that you also, you also, she's also a part of the package. All right? So you, she also has to, you have to marry her and take care of her according to the law. Okay? All of a sudden there's a barrier there. He's like, well, I don't think I can do that. So he's concerned about interfering with his other inheritance and and then marrying a Moabite woman. But Boaz has seen this woman's character, and he's able to look past that barrier of her being a Moabite, and he's ready to marry this woman. And so thankfully, the guy turns down the offer. They take off sandals, and they, they shake. They do this, you know, old ancient handshake in front of everybody. Uh, interesting. And then they get married. They get married. All right? So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. So, like, all these other details in the story, like, uh, uh, you know, leading up to this, and now it's just in one sentence. They got married, and they had a baby. One sentence. They got married, and they have a baby. And I love, the Lord gave her conception. Remember, she was married ten years before this, and she didn't have any babies. She was barren. That is a bad thing in the ancient world. That is seen as a curse and, and a very hard thing for a woman in the ancient world. But the Lord is the one who gives children, and they are a gift from God. The Lord gave children. She bore a son. And then the, the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you today without a Redeemer. May his name be renowned in Israel. Now they're acknowledging the work of God he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age uh, uh, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. 
Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and she became his nurse. Naomi's a grandma. She has a grandbaby now. Have you ever seen how grandparents interact with their newborn grandchildren and how fun and giddy they get around their children and how delightful it is? And so we, at the beginning of the story, we have tragedy, difficulty, bitterness, struggle, and now we have life. Now we have redemption. Now we have God restoring Naomi to live up to what her name really means, pleasant through his hesed, through his mercy, through his kindness and goodness, he does this. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is significant because all of a sudden we see Ruth, the Moabite, included in the lineage of King David, one of the most important Old Testament figures. All of a sudden, this Moabite woman who it seemed like nobody noticed her, nobody saw her hardship and difficulty in the darkest time of Israel, one of the darkest times of Israel, God saw and God takes her, brings redemption, turns things around for her and her mother-in-law, and then puts her in the lineage of David. She becomes the great-grandmother of King David. And not only David, it gets even better than this. Because you keep on traveling on down the lineage line, and you'll see that she becomes a part of the lineage of our Messiah, the ultimate Redeemer, Jesus Christ. There is glory, beauty, and redemption. And God is excellent at taking bitter circumstances and making them sweet. Know that God will bring sweet redemption out of the most bitter and difficult situations in your life. Do what is right in God's sight and live faithful before him. And he will put you where you need to be and lead you to where you need to go. Look for traces of his goodness in your life. Amen. And so let's respond to God. I know that there are many saints who struggle believing that God is at work in their their trials. Believing that God is for them, that God is good, that God is sovereign. I know that this, our faith gets tested in this when times are tough. And if there's anybody here today that one is going through a bitter, difficult time that is just afflicting you, tearing you apart, and you need God's mercy to surround you. You need him to shelter you with his wings. We want to pray for you. If there's anybody here today, this morning, that that hasn't experienced the redemption that we've been talking about through the blood of Jesus Christ, hasn't experienced Jesus becoming Savior and Lord of your life and rescuing you out of sinfulness and out of darkness and out of despair and hopelessness and purposelessness, and you want to be redeemed today, Jesus is willing and he's able to do that for you today. Today, he will do that. If you'll just respond, just come in faith to him. We have three today who are going to declare that he's done that. Declare that he's their redeemer and savior and Lord right after this time. So if you want prayer, just raise your hand. We'll come to you or you can come come, come up front as we sing this next song. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe Live for you 